Greetings, brothers and sisters. So I watched a movie last night called Outside the Wire. It was released by Netflix uh, on January 15th last year of 2021. So it's been out there for about a year. And it starts off here. It takes place in 2036. Not a good movie. I'm not recommending it. But there were some interesting either predictive programming or whatever you want to call it. I'll get into all that in a moment. My you know, personal explanation of this. The storyline of the movie is the guy who plays the Falcon in the Marvel movies uh, is a some sort of um, a robot or android creation. He looks like a human being, acts like a human being, but he is, you know, a bot. And there is a, um, a guy who's getting punished for disobeying orders who's a drone, who's a drone flyer. And so they're punishing him by putting him in the front lines of a war that's going on in the Ukraine, right? Eastern European war. And it is um, stuff that's going on right now, right? So this is uh, the first part of it. Want to make the Ukraine a part of Russia. They want to make the Ukraine a part of Russia, right? Like in the good old days. The guy says, like in the good old days. When Ukraine used to be a part of Russia, and it's something that, you know, is going on now a year later. So the Krasnys, um, which is this group, uh, you know, a T group, is sort of like these two provinces that want to leave the Ukraine, right? So these are the bad guys. Remember, uh, two days ago, Putin said these two place dumbass, one was <laughs> dumbass and something else. There are these two provinces that he's saying... Um, he's recognizing their independence from the Ukraine because, um, you know, and today I woke up and after watching this last night and it said that Putin is, you know, um, at war with the Ukraine now. And so these Krasnys are trying to take the, U the Ukraine and bring it back to Russia. And the story is taking place right in this area here. Krasnys are getting stronger with the full support of Moscow. So this has actually just been playing out. So Putin gave this speech talking about how these two regions, Dumbass and the other one, can't remember, don't tell me, don't care, don't need to know, that these, these regions that were closer to Russia were pro-Russian. They didn't want to secede from Russia in the first place, and they've been tortured and abused by the Ukrainians, right? That's the Russians' position on this. And in this movie that you know, happened 13 months ago, was released 13 months ago, these regions are the ones that are causing the problem in for poor Ukraine, right? <laughs> you know, like, so there is um, a conflict in the story, and this story supports the official narrative from the U.S. that's going on now. We're the assholes in the middle of it. So um, he said that, the war got too hot for the U.N. I have to ed edit some of this stuff out because of copywriting, right? And so that America now is there being so-called peacekeepers, right? But, you know, as it turns out, the Americans are not portrayed as the good guys in this thing. I'll talk about that as we go through these various clips. We're peacekeepers. We're the only thing stopping these guys from committing genocide against each other. You believe that I have a timeshare in Florida I want to sell you. So, um, you know, this guy's telling the young guy that America isn't doing this to be like, you know, noble because we don't. Right. Let's um, <laughs> let's just, you know, like call it what it is, even in this Netflix movie. There's intel that says Kobo is responsible for the dirty bomb set off in Kiev using Russian uranium. So they're talking about Kiev here, right, which is now on the table where they're saying the Russians are going to invade Kiev. And he said this, um, you know, this guy, this Russian-backed, um, you know, whatever he is, T guy, right, is, um, is uh, you know, set off a dirty bomb in Kiev. Even after Ukraine's independence, the country still held one-third of Russia's nuclear arsenal. So they're saying here that there is still um, Russian nukes in the Ukraine because Russia had uh, nuclear bombs or nuclear missiles all over the Ukraine because it's closer to Europe and America, right? So the east coast of America. And so when Russia seceded from, I mean, when the Ukraine seceded from Russia, they still had 
all of these nukes. And so, you know, interesting plot line here for something that involves um, potentially World War III going on about a year later, right? Silos scattered across the country at top secret locations. So this is an inter interesting twist in the real life drama playing out now. Ready to strike anywhere in the world. So that's, you know, I mean, yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? <laughs> Given what's happened, I don't know, a year and a month later. So there's two other things here. Uh, first, there's robot soldiers. There's this guy who's an android, the star of the movie. Um, and then there's these robot soldiers. This is kind of important too, I thought, right? These robot soldiers. That's why he's gone rogue. Because he's learned who the real enemy is. <laughs> the real enemy, who? So this woman is the uh, charge of the rebels, which is a group that's trying to bring peace and is not aligned with either the U.S. or the Russians. The U.S. military? They rationalize this war because it serves their fucking agenda. This is a peacekeeping mission. Peace. So here's the big line here where she um, says what this current war, you know, the fictional war in the movie, but what's going on now in, you know, the world. And there's truth telling here. Russia wants its former territories back. The U.S. wants to destabilize Russia by extending conflict in those countries. So the Anthony, the Anthony Mackie character, the robot guy, he's played everybody, right? He's you know turned against, he's gone rogue against the U.S. and he's played the rebels who are trying to bring peace and he's played both sides and he's allowed this other guy to kill him at the end of the movie. They're at the nuclear silos. And he says the reason he went rogue is he wants the United States not to make more of him. So let's listen to this part right here. Understand that these wars must end. And I am the face of never ending war. And so what he says is he doesn't want more. He says he's a monster and he doesn't want, you know, he's got the ability to feel even though he's an android, all this stuff. A lot of plot holes. But interesting in the sense that, you know, he's saying here that um, if there was more of him, that there would be never-ending war because it's androids that look like people and they can go anywhere as opposed to the robots. They're already, you know, the robot wars and things like this. Again, only 14 years from now and all of these things are going on. I mean, are starting right now. The whole conflict that's portrayed in this movie is starting right now. So you guys remember this. Um, well, let's just play it here. It's from uh, Council on Foreign Relations. To convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had, they were walking out to the press conference and said, no, nah, I said, I'm not going to, or, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was what, six hours. I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid at the time. Well, there's still, they, so they made some genuine, s substantial. So that prosecutor was involved with Burisma, you guys remember, it was a whole thing. Because Burisma employed Jojo Magoo's crackhead son and, you know, with all this stuff. That was the part of the whole Ukraine deal where, where Trump wrote to the Ukrainian president, right? And Ukraine is a very corrupt place. And here's this guy, Skifty Skift, remember, like, but remember how much they were talking about how corrupt Ukraine was during the impeachment. This led to the impeachment of Trump, right? That Trump wanted dirt on the Bidens because Hunter Biden was a crackhead and had, as far as I know, never even been to the Ukraine and made a million dollars, you know, just by his relationship with his father. I mean, they hired a crackhead, a guy who was smoking crack during the period that he was working for Burisma, a, a Ukrainian gas company. Of course, there's 
you know, if there is still nuclear missiles in the Ukraine, that is what it is. I mean, I don't, you know, it was just in the movie, like, um, but it made sense that they would have them there, and who knows what that's about. But in terms of the energy that's there, natural gas and whatever else is going on in terms of, you know, there's a lot of energy stuff there, oil and things. And so, like, that's a big part of it. But a very corrupt place. And America doesn't do things because we're nice or we're, you know, peacekeepers. And, you know, it even stated this in this crappy Netflix movie. And so, you know, there's all this corruption and the Bidens are knee deep in it, you know, all of it, right? And they, they talked about the corruption throughout the impeachment hearing of Trump. And now here we are, like, you know, this corrupt country that America has given billions of dollars to. And, you know, what, right? Like now we're getting sucked into a war with Russia and not sucked into it because we're, you know, completely uh, involved in it. And so these were the, the front page today. Attack underway, explosions across the Ukraine. New Putin screed. So here it says um, sirens, explosions. So there's now war with Russia and the Ukraine and, you know, all these things. I mean, it's happening. And America is going to be involved in some way or another. American troops, you know, I've already talked about the polling numbers and, you know, all the economic issues that we have. So this is live at CNN here. Um, things going on here in Russia. Let's go ahead and tune into it here. I can hear you, Clarissa. I hope you can stay with me. These are the victims right now of an unprovoked attack, an unprovoked attack from Russia. And when you see scenes like this in the subway, you know, it's reminiscent. I'll keep talking while Clarissa dials back in. You see people there hiding in the subway stations in Kharkiv. It's, you know, reckons back to the London Blitz where people in London during World War II hid in the tube stations while the Going with this, the London Blitz, you're bringing back World War II, and this is unprovoked attack by Russia. You're, you know, why? <laughs> like, what are you trying to sell here, buddy, right? <laughs> You're trying to sell us into war with Russia? Look at this tragedy. Like, you know, we care so much about these people. We're so caring. We're so, United States, we care. We're the defenders of the world. We care, right? We're the evil empire, bro. Like, come on. The Germans were assaulting. That's what's happening in Kharkiv. And what Clarissa said there also strikes true. We know there are tanks on the way. We saw the tanks rolling from this part of Russia right here. Tanks, the tanks on the way. The tanks coming any moment now. The tanks, they're right, here. right here. Look at my finger. Where I put. Look at the circles I made. Those are where. That represents where tanks are coming in. The tanks. Toward Kharkiv, where Clarissa is. That's what could be arriving where those people are in the next few hours. We're going to get back to Clarissa in a moment. CNN special live coverage continues right after this. So from my perspective, now if you've been listening to my other videos, I've made, I think, a video yesterday and the day before I read these prophecies, these um, channel prophecies from Whispers of the Brighter World, which is a part of the heartfulness literature, and talking about how Adam, A-T-O-M, will ruin this world and that there's going to be all these upheavals that are going to have their root in what I can only say is nuclear war, right? Talking about nuclear energy and these things. Um, and so, and that is a nest, uh, and, and it's said that it's a necessity that we need to be, um, you know, humbled in a way we need to take responsibility for going against God, which all of us have participated in because in the truth community, everyone wants to blame it on all on the elite, the elite people and the elite people suck. You know, the people I call the controllers, they suck and they suck worse than, you know, lots of us right? But we're all a part of it. Like we've all gone down a demonic path. We've gone away from God and we're about ego. Like we're an egotistical, ego oriented as opposed to soul oriented, right? A soul driven existence is a book that I wrote that, you know, is about um, transforming abuse, right? Having your soul drive your existence as opposed to your ego driving your existence. And so I used to talk about this quite a bit, but uh, I haven't talked about it in a while. If you're a soul-driven existence, then your soul and your spiritual essence is your, you know, you defer to your soul and you're following your soul's path and you're serving God and you're, you know, you're sacrificing egotistical 
pleasures, you know, things about your, uh, things that would benefit your ego, accomplishments, you know, things building your self-esteem in a sense, your, you know, your ego in a sense of like, oh, I'm, a, I'm so great, whatever it is, right? And that's what we are. We're, we're egocentric people, but we could be soul-driven in the sense that we are connected to God and we're on our soul's path and we're finding our you know, our true purpose in this world, why we came down in the first place. And very few people do that. This is what the heartfulness system helps people achieve. It helps people connect to God and get their, you know, get their path laid out for them within themselves, not some external authority, not some external presence, not some religion, not some, you know, saint or spiritual master or some other person where you figure out what you're supposed to do Take responsibility for your, you know, your soul's purpose here and embrace it, right? And that's ultimately what the heartfulness system is supposed to help people do, you know, when people are able to rise up to that, right? Able to rise up to their own internal connection. God is in everything and everyone, including you. God exists inside of you. God created you. And you have a soul that's created your physical body and your ego. But your ego goes rogue. And so... We're living in a world where everyone's ego has gone rogue to one extent or another. Some people are worse than others, but you know, it's all bad. And so our leadership is a reflection of this. Like they're the most egotistical than, you know, everyone else, but we're all a part of it. We're all a part of the problem. And it's, you know, when, when you're an ego driven person, you're on the path to become demonic where you're anti-God you're and you're willfully going against the will of the divine will, the divine rules, the divine, uh, you know, the divine authority. And so that only ends badly because once you disconnect from God, then you're on your own and it's just one mistake after another. And there's consequences and building consequences for those mistakes. And then there's the illusion, the lies, you're lying to yourself, you're lying to other people. There's this collective insanity, a collective deception, right? Self-deception. And the truth keeps on trying to slap people in the face. And if it's ignored, then it just grows into, you know, eventually like a giant truth bomb. You know, not the truther stuff. I'm not talking about truther. You know, I'm talking about spiritual truth and, you know, everything. Like It's like far beyond what's covered in the, you know, the so-called truth movement, which is centered around how the people I call the controllers, what many people call the elite, are the problem. And they're not the problem. They're a part of the problem. And we're the other part of the problem, right? Because we're all in this together. We're all creating this and we're all on the same path, right? Some people break off from it and become spiritual and start following their soul and working for God. And that's, you know, true. people who truly do that are, are, are far and few, uh, few and far between. So the breakdown of civilization is happening because it goes against the will of God, but it happens anyway. Like there's times good civilizations natural civilizations are going to end as well. Everything comes to an end for whatever reason, right? Good time periods. I mean, you know, we're, we're leaving the Kali Yuga, but there'll be another Kali Yuga, right? The Kali Yuga, Kali is this, you know, demon uh, god of destru- goddess of destruction, right? And it's more than that, right? And so it's the age of iron, which is, you know, very materialistic, And then it ends, and then there's a sort of a renaissance, and it goes to a spiritual period of time, right? And, you know, the the things that, you know, like sociopaths do well during the Kali Yuga, but are thrown out of society in every other Yuga. So, you know, that's part of this thing as well. And so there's natural cycles and natural flow to this thing, you know, everything that we're going through. And, you know, everything that we know now has got to end because it, it does, it's not good for anybody. And whatever good there is, you know, it's great if you could, if we could take some of the good things with us, but, you know, we'll see if that happens or not. I don't know. It really it's not, you know, it's not going to concern most of us because of the, you know, this is a 200 year sort of collapse of, I mean, I'm just guessing. I don't know. <laughs> I have no, I think it's you know, around 200 years, whatever it is, you know, long period of time of the collapse and these calamities one after another as it's talked about in Whispers of the Brighter World, and then, you know, a rebirth of something better. So 
the bad thing has to end, the demonic thing has to end, for the godly thing to take its place. And as bad as this is going to suck for most of us, and, you know, I don't know what the time frame is, we can all take comfort in that there is something better coming, right? That something bad has to end for something good to take its place. The problem, of course, we're 100% dependent on this system, and most of us don't have the skills and ability to do something else, right? To, you know, go back to the old ways and all these things. In a world that's not going to be nearly an erect world, right? A world that isn't as abundant, as contaminated, and, you know, all the radioactive fallout, all the, you know, issues that are going to be happening, the, the poor health of people, and just the psychological, you know, crushing of people who don't understand or are not prepared for what, what is about to happen in their collective fear and, you know, anxiety and all these things, because we're all connected on various levels, emotionally and mentally. And when your whole, you know, when the human system breaks down and people are flipped out and there's panic and chaos, it spreads like, you know, the kind of like group consciousness you experience at like a football game or something or a mob, all these things. So that's all, you know, that's all part of it. But we can take refuge in the fact that our system's bad and something good is going to come and replace it, right? Like that's part of a, you know, a divine plan to correct the mistakes and the, you know, going in the wrong direction that we've all embraced here. But on a more, you know, current level, mundane and, you know, more the materialistic level, which what we're seeing right now with the beginning of America wanting to go to war with Russia here, because that's what this is about, because this concerns Russia and the Ukraine. And of course, there's, you know, these, there's energy, there's gas, there's things. But I turned on the news this morning when I was eating breakfast, and there were a couple of things that were said. So one was on CNN, and they were talking about how they want to give these various economic sanctions to the, to the Soviets, but Soviets could cut off gas, the energy to Europe, and Europe would free. I mean, there's all these, you know, ways that everything's intertwined. And they were saying that the, economic sanctions they were proposing could do severe damage to the Russian economy. Of course, that means millions of Russian children suffering. And I mean, the whole country, right? These are innocent people, sweet people, because I, you know, know some of them who do the heartfulness meditation. And those people are going to be, you know, just better anyways. But there are a lot of just sweet Russian and sweet Ukrainian people. And to them, they're like, they hang out together. Like, it's like, America and Canada, even like even more so because they weren't, you know, separate that long ago. And they speak the same language and they have the same customs. I mean, it's different regions, you know, just like southern and northern people. But the Russians and the Ukrainians at the ashram in India where I used to go, you know, the one in, in Chennai, were always, and I'm sure the, the one now, were always hanging out with each other, right? Like they didn't see much of a difference. In fact, there's these two girls that were always going to see Master Charge, a young Russian girls. And one, I think one was Ukrainian, one was Russian. And they were like best friends, right? And so, you know, there's that's my experience of the people. The people are, are nice and, you know, I mean, all of them. They're just like sweet people. And so I didn't like, there wasn't any, I didn't meet any of them that were just like intolerable. But of course, you know, there was language issues and I didn't really have much of a experience with them. But they're like, you know, the innocent people, the, the good people, the hardworking people in any country. And so they're going to suffer from these economic sanctions, especially kids. Kids always bear the brunt of this for whatever reason, child poverty. But then they were saying they were worried that the economic sanctions might affect the global economy. And so we know that the American economy, we're like a trillion dollars in debt or more, and that this is a big part of it, right? You, they go from one thing to another. You notice that like COVID never really ended. Like COVID is now not talked about and they're, you know, they're, they're getting rid of all the mandates and whatever things that are left and people are over COVID. Like people are behaving like, you know, you see less and less mass and, you know, only the, the hardcore people, but COVID basically ended without them saying, oh, it ended. Right. And saying why it ended, which is Omicron. I mean, that's the official story, but they don't say it. They're not, there's not some closure to COVID. It's like they're leaving that door open. But now it's like, all right, let's go in on the Ukraine war. Like, that's what they're covering. Like, they've just, 
instead of having some a clear ending, right, a clear sort of um, resolution to COVID, they're just moving from that to this. And then, you know, they got to get the Americans to buy into our involvement. Of course, Americans want no part of this. I covered that yesterday. Only 15% want American military, uh, you know, inside of you, the Ukraine, because we don't want to be sucked into another bogus war, especially after all the lies with Afghanistan, right? And so, you know, there's just uh, a wag the dog aspect to this. If you saw the wag the dog movie, which is a good movie to watch from time to time. My wife and I watched it about two years ago. But they started a fake war in Bosnia or someplace like that, you know, because the president was accused of inappropriate conduct with like a 12-year-old, 13, 14-year-old girl or something. And they were, you know, it's like a week before the election, they were trying to wag the dog, the tail wagging the dog, and create some sort of fake war story to make the president a hero and distract from this scandal, this news that was about to break, right? And so this is like a wag the dog type situation where this guy, you know, these CNN guys are, you know, promoting how evil Putin is and comparing him to, you know, all these other despots and, you know, the America's got to go in there like we did in World War II, but that's not, that's not going to happen. Like that, that ship has sailed and how much they're shilling and selling this war. And Biden, we all like kind of know Biden's a complete tool and joke and he's not calling the shots here. And so there's like that aspect of it, like the mundane, you know, just the show, the story that's going on. And then on Morning Joe, Joe Scarborough, the guy who, you know, the guy who's the star of the show until Mika sort of took over. (laughs) And he was talking about how that in the, you know, he brought up the trial. Like I had already made the first part of this video. Like this is the voiceover part. But I made the first part of the video. I went to eat breakfast. And Joe Scarborough Scarborough brought brought up the impeachment trial and how the Ukraine was talked about, like I, I was already talking about that here. And he said, he, he brought up the how the Russians hacked the DNC. So you remember that the Russians hacked the DNC and also hacked Podesta. And it wasn't really conclusive. It was an independent person or whatever it was, right? And so he said that, the, that our intelligence community did such a great job of pinpointing how Russia, you know, who did it and where the building it was done, the hacking and who the people were and what they, how, you know, how they did it. And he said, our intelligence community is so great and Russia must be really scared right now because of how spot on our intelligence community is. And our intelligence stuff is evil, right? Like that's a big part of the problem, the lies, the secrets, the psychological operations, all the manipulation. It's, you know, low love of behavior, immoral behavior, ungodly behavior not allowing the divine will to run its course. That's another problem now. Trying to control something that, um, you know, shouldn't be controlled. It's just, it has to happen. Like our society has got to crumble. It's, you know, it's time. And so the other piece was that he's bragging on the intelligence community, but I'm like, why didn't they stop the DNC and Podesta from being hacked, right? Podesta wrote up a whole report for Obama. It was like 25 pages and he was in charge of it on cybersecurity, and then he handed his password over to a hacker, right, like that, and all the things that that cost, right, and so, you know, they're trying to make Russians the villains and the demons, but come on, like, I don't think anybody really buys into that, like, we care so much about the Ukraine, when there's other countries that, you know, are invading other countries, including America, what America did in the Arab Spring, and doing regime change, and, you know, are you saying that we get to, you know, just go around the world and bomb people and, you know, get rid of leaders like Gaddafi, who was a good leader, and, and loot, like America and, and France and these countries looted Libya, and Libya had all this gold, and we looted them of their natural resources and things, right? After some, you know, bogus reason that Gaddafi was hurting his people, and like that didn't happen. The UN, which is, you know, the UN corrupt and evil put out a resolution saying that Gaddafi was hurting his people. It turned out his people loved him. He had 70% approval, and he had met all the UN Millennium Development Goals. I've talked about Gaddafi and Libya so much, right? And so you're saying America can do that, but Russia can't. Like, America can have nuclear weapons, but Iran can't, right? 
like we're somehow better and we're more noble. And, you know, it's just, I mean, for most of us, it's like, uh, come on, you're still saying that crap, right? People are still buying that. Come on, right? You know, we're the empire. We're the evil empire. You know, not that these countries are better. It's just we have the most power and we're, you know, it's a demonic system and we're, you know, we're leading the way in this demonic path, right? I mean, it's the people behind the scenes and the controllers, all those things. But all of us are, you know, disconnected. I mean, most people are disconnected from God, their family and nature. And we're, you know, operating. We've all gone rogue. Our, our egos have gone rogue. And our souls have been left in the dust. And that's, you know, what's causing all of these issues and what needs to be reversed. But whenever you engage in something like this, um, you can't control the outcome. Like the World War II, America became like a beacon, a hero, and like just, you know, the greatest generation, right? And then there was the baby boom that happened, the baby boomers, and all these young people growing up in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, there was this economic boom because of World War II. And then the military industrial complex and all these things. And, you know, so that had that effect. It's like we rolled the dice, we went into war, you know, and it was controlled. There was other things going on there, but, you know, that's what happened. America became the most dominant, most important country economically and militarily. We became the empire. And then, you know, there's these other wars and the other, the latest wars haven't gone so well for us, Vietnam and then these wars in, uh, you know, the Arab Spring Wars and the Iraq War and the Afghanistan stuff, they've all sort of, you know, been a distraction and hurt America. But this one is just going to go the other way, right? This is going to backfire, and America is being taken down, partly because of what the, you know, controllers are doing. But it's uh, there's a divine reason for this, right? It's time for America's reign of terror to end, and, you know, we're all going to suffer for this, right? Because once you, li- you know, we'll see something that we've never seen before, we, we haven't lived in a time where America wasn't the number one, right? USA, USA. We, we haven't lived in a time where America is, you know, hurting and, and like all these things. We haven't lived through the Depression and, you know, it's going to be much worse than that. So, um, yeah, that's all, you know, that's all going to suck. But there's always spiritual benefits to dark times, right? That's, a, you know, one of the most beautiful teachings of the Heartfulness System. Miseries is divine blessings. And that when you go through difficult times, that's the time when you can evolve spiritually the most. If you come in with an attitude that this is, you know, everything's coming from God. There's a reason we're experiencing this and we got to be grateful. And as we go through this period of time, you know, that's, that's where we are, right? This is, you know, the beginning of that, right? The next four or five years are the prequel to the collapse of America and then you know, we see it already happening and just on a moral level and just how bad people suck. But, you know, it's the economic collapse and the, you know, the losing of that top position and, you know, the infighting and the division and, you know, our lifestyle dramatically changing and the things that we, you know, feel like we're entitled to disappearing. And so that's what, you know, this is a part of. And it's the next step. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely reporting for the apocalypse. In the ascension, everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.